It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, that meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom. Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feed showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, the Foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall 
and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the Blood Pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal, and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months, before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid, and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall, because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point. But we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. 
It was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature. Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility, that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, It gets bigger and stronger every day, and now we've made it angry. Now go check out SCP-087 The Stairwell and SCP-096 The Shy Guy for more classic Foundation foes.